Hey, folks, this is Carlo Coliacomo, and you're listening to the best podcast out there. Nasty Knuckles. Give me some of those knuckles, baby. You're listening to Nasty Knuckles, the Hockey Outlaws podcast, with your host, Terry Nasty Sotomayor and former Philadelphia Flyer Enforcer Riley Cote as they go behind the scenes with your favorite NHL players. Time to face off. All right, welcome back. What is happening, Nasty? What's up, Riggs? Apparently, it's time for a nap for some of us. I don't know. <laughs> well, the it's it's 4 a.m., dude. <laughs> no. uh, what's Ready going on, brother? Oh, Just uh, another week here. A um, little men's league game last night. Yeah, recovering you were, you from were, that one. You were on your, uh, you had your A game last night. No yeah. tucks, one little apple. Yeah. But you played uh, well. Played our buddies. Well the rested, Devils. dude. Yeah, you were well re- Well, I wasn't because I was up pretty late no, from our clear party oh my god which was awesome um i don't know what happened to baller he disappeared for a little bit i know he did we're gonna get to the bottom of this this guy was he was money the other night after losing his phone oh man that could be the worst feeling and but we got it back within a couple hours and then thank god this guy i'd never seen someone more relieved and his mojo it was flying oh yeah he was he was buzzing around and he disappeared just like you did. <laughs> yeah, but he disappeared for good reasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you to disappeared because you were tired. <laughs> yeah. That was a hell of a party. Though. It was awesome, oh, man. Yeah. Never been that cold, though, I don't think, in my life. At the first part well, the first of it. first part, yeah. <laughs> Outside, but it was Uptown a Uptown Beer Garden. Yeah, so it was, it was uh, awesome, though. Awesome time. Then, Great uh, party. Wow. Yeah, they helped, did a hell of a job. Yeah, yeah. they sure did. Um, talking about uh, last night's game, you had a nice little, last night, little, little snake back door. Uh, well, he made a, the initial save. And uh, well, you're, I was you're hanging right there, is I it? was there. I was saying, well, I wasn't moving. That's <laughs> the problem. My feet weren't moving last night. But, uh, yeah, it was fun, man. Uh, I was feeling it, though. You I were? Was, I was a little tired. No, I mean, I was feeling oh, tired. Oh, you feel tired? Yeah, well, I guess yeah. so. Well, but, you're um, creeping on 40, so, I mean. Close, you, close. You know. Let's, well, you're not supposed to say that because it's 40 over Lee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, just Bend messing the rules. around. The rules, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a few guys under, young legs. underage yeah. in that league. So Of course. Um, anyway, great party. Our buddies at Clear. Um, unreal. Yeah. Unreal night. That was a good time. And then Flyer Line, not a whole lot to report. Uh, squeezed out a win the other day yes. against the, the LA Kings, Thank breaking the 13 them. game losing streak. Uh, but uh, outside of that, there's really not a whole lot to talk about. Nast, I mean, yeah. you got some young, you got some young blood in the lineup. Obviously, a very depleted lineup. Yeah. Um, G, heading to his seventh All Star game, which is yeah, absolutely. I amazing. feel like he, ever since he first got in his first All Star game, I'm. I don't know, I guess it could be argued, but I feel like he could have probably been in every All-Star game oh, there has sure. been since then. I mean, there was a couple times there wasn't, but uh, his seventh of his career, well-deserved. He's definitely the best player on the team. 100%. Um, and uh, it's great great for Claude. Um, kind of break the season up a little bit and maybe have some yeah. fun in Vegas. I doubt it's much fun there. Yeah, probably going to bed 10, <laughs> yeah. 10 30 p.m. <laughs> yeah, but congrats to Claude for that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, big big uh, accomplishment and hell of a leader. You know, yeah. keep talking. Always keep talking about G because I feel like he's one of the highlights of the season. Thirty four years old and and still being able to produce the way he is and yeah. and still care and have that passion. But uh, yeah, it'd be nice for him to go have a little fun, unwind a little bit. Hopefully, he can yeah. come back and maybe get some bodies back and have a little success in this final stretch uh, yeah. towards the end of the season. But uh, also wanted to bring up last week headed to. Uh, New Cura Leaf location in yes. Wayne, PA. That was the awesome. Fourteenth location, and uh, it was nice to see some people and uh, obviously support our sponsor. Yes, it was a hell of a job, CuraLeaf.com, yep. and uh, you know, do an amazing job with uh, cannabis education and and uh, helping patients find the medicine they need. So appreciate all the people at Cura Leaf, uh, yep. very knowledgeable people and. Thanks for having us. Yes, that was awesome too. Episode 60, dude. Yeah, that's right. You ready 60. to go? 
60. Jesus. It's awesome. Carlo Koliakovo. Let's go, Coco. Here we go. Love of the Coco. Welcome back. I'm Riley Cote. And I'm Derek Suttlemeyer. And this week, we are fortunate to have our good friend, former first round draft pick of the Toronto Maple Leafs, our good, good buddy. Yeah, <laughs> Carlo <laughs> Koliakovo. It only took me four times. I apologize, buddy. Man, we had a little celery meltdown here, ladies and gentlemen, but we welcome our main man, Carlo. What's up, Coco? What's going on, boys? Love the intro, man. We made that song I hit when I my five day back in. <laughs> Yes, we Love did. Coco. Oh, that was the, that was the that was game winning intro. song once uh, Coco uh, joined the team. And I remember us cranking it at home and that stereo, you know how loud it is oh, in, yeah. the, in the oh, center. Yeah. And all I remember is uh, Hexy sticking his head down the hallway and saying, probably shouldn't be blaring that song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people think they might know what that. I'm like, it's Coco. It's Coco. Co it's Carlo. He goes, don't play that. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. <laughs> How yeah. are you, brother? Uh, I'm doing great, buddy. You know, just trying to stay sane here in the beautiful province of Ontario where, you know, we're still in lockdown. And uh, it's crazy to think two years we're still here. But, um, you know, just trying to have fun uh, watching sports, talking sports and catching up with old buddies like yourselves. Yeah, man, we appreciate your time, buddy. Absolutely. Um, what 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 exactly are you doing? You got a lot of stuff going on. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so uh, I'm currently right now doing a morning sports show, uh, morning sports talk radio on TSN. Uh, I got my own show from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. with a uh, good pal of mine, Aaron Kronick. Uh, we're first up um, on TSN 1050. And then with that, I... I've joined the, the hockey department too. I, I'm an analyst on uh, TSN hockey games with uh, the Montreal Canadiens, the Ottawa Senators, and uh, the odd time I get thrown a bone and call a Maple Leafs game, which is pretty cool, pretty awesome. But, um, you know, I like to consider it the next best thing to play in the, the game of hockey, which, you know, I played for 16 years pro, 14 years NHL, where, you know, you're still living the life of what hockey is, but you're not stressing out the same way where you're covering <laughs> it, a, you know, the, the, in a different way where, you know, you're watching, you're analyzing and you're just having fun doing it. And you're still, you're making you know new friends and you're still staying in contact with the friends you've made. And, um, you know, it's to think that I turned 39 years old uh, the other day and just to think of some of the other 39 year olds that are still playing the game. I just sit here and scratch my head and saying, I don't know how these guys are doing it. Um, <laughs> glad I'm not doing it, but I'm also very grateful that, you know, I walked into a, uh, you know, a nice trend. I had a nice transition into my post career into the media. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you do a great job with it too. Um, it, it, you just try to have fun with it. You, know? you got it. Yeah. Right? Use everything you learn, use everything you learn throughout your career and try to share your perspective on things and just have fun doing it. Right. Was that something you wanted to get into? Do you know you wanted to get into media towards the end of your career? Honestly, Riley, it was the last thing in the world I ever thought I would get into. Really? Because, okay. Because, you know, well, you live in Toronto, right? You hear so much of the media and <laughs> right. the good and bad things that, you know, come with it. And I had a great passion for hockey. And, you know, when you get to a certain point in your 30s, you know, you start to – you know, reality starts to set in where, you know, in my later parts of my career, at least my last four years, I was playing a role as a depth player, which wasn't really something I was happy about because I always knew I was better than that. But it was something that I knew I needed to do and be really good at if I wanted to extend my career in the league. And, you know, as, as you guys would know, playing in Philly, that's the role I played there. And you just try to make the most of your situation, be a good teammate, you know, be ready when you're, when your name is called and um, try to make the best of every opportunity. And when you're, when you're going through that path, you're obviously playing alongside, you know, some great teammates playing for some great coaches and you're just learning so much about the game of hockey. And as the door starts to close, you start to wonder, okay, what am I going to do next? I can't play hockey forever as much as, you know, I want to play hockey as long as my body would allow me to play. You know, but 
the, the thing that I worried about the most was what I was going to do, but how quickly I was going to do it. Because, you know, you talk to guys that, that encounter those situations and it doesn't always fall in their lap right away. So the one thing I always, you know, at least prioritized was just being a great student of the game. Try to, you know, gather as much information and as many learning experiences as you possibly can so that, you can use those, you know, those those intangibles and tr uh, uh, translate them to your post career. And I always thought, because of that, I was going to stay in the game either with, with coaching, player development, maybe find my way somewhere in management somewhere, or some time. But uh, before all that, you know, you go to I I went to Europe for two years, and I tell you what, guys, it was probably the best decision I made for my career because it at least allowed me to go out on my own terms, mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, in the NHL, you have some shortcomings where what you, what you want to achieve sometimes isn't the same thing somebody else wants to give you where, you know, you think you can still play, but there's always somebody else that's younger Yep. and cheaper that yep. provides that same opportunity for teams. And believe me, that was the thing I hated the most in my later, my career was that <laughs> the young guy, you know, the younger, up with cheaper the guy, guys, guy. when yeah. right, younger, cheaper guys, when you had guys like myself that knew how to play the game, you know, knew what it took to be a professional, the ins and outs of every day that would just go out, know how to do the job. So going to Europe allowed me to at least transition to that, where I, I went to Germany, played in Mannheim, which was an incredible spot to play. You know, we, we had an NHL facility with 14,000 fans, packed house awesome. every night, oh, soccer-style awesome. atmosphere. And you go to that team, and you're you're the best player on that team now. And it's like, you're like, see, I always knew I could do this, and I knew I wasn't ready to, to, to give it up just yet. And the fun for hockey starts to come back, again, even though you're, you know, you're near the end. So in my second year there, um, when I decided to go back, obviously I – I had hopes to play on the Olympic team because that's, you know, the NHL players weren't going and um, I had a good chance. I was on, you know, their short list to go there and something that I hadn't experienced in almost eight years, it was an injury plagued year um, for me. And, you know, with knee, with shoulder twice, you started to start to reevaluating where you are. And ultimately with two kids, a family, you know, coming back that year after my second year where I didn't get a chance to play, participate in the Olympics, I finished the year injured. You pack 13 bags to come home with still, a, you know, 13 bags still there. And, you're, you know, you start to say, OK, well, what what should I potentially start thinking of doing? And luckily for me, like you talk about perfect timing in life for things. There was an opportunity at TSN that presented itself in the media. And I wasn't really too crazy about it at first, but. Something I always said to myself was just keep the door open. Keep be, yeah. have an open mind to right. anything, right? So I went in. I learned about the job. I learned about, you know, the people that I'd be working with. And they allowed me to at least do a PTO, like a player tryout yeah. on the job. And <laughs> after my first day, I walked away with the biggest smile on my face. And I started saying to myself, wow, I'm talking sports for a living. Something yeah. I do in my everyday life as it is. Right. But I get to get paid to do this now as a job. <laughs> like this sounds too good to be it's surreal. So, <laughs> right. So it just it just something that grew on me. Uh something with more experience, more reps, more opportunity. And just understanding that being in that in that working environment still allowed me to be so close to the game of hockey, which is what I love. And not just talking hockey, talking other sports, you know. Yeah, that's the, cool. Yeah, that's and that's the thing. Like, I'm not, and I'm one of those rare guys that not doesn't just know hockey. I basically know the ins and outs of every sport because I grew up a sports fan. Right. You know, like I love the NFL. It's one of my favorite sports to talk, even though hockey is, you know, my go-to because I played it. But I love playing golf. I'll talk golf. You know, yeah. I love playing basketball. The Raptors have been a great story. And Major League Baseball, right? I mean, it's it's the only sport that goes on the summertime. So if you want to watch sports, that's what you're watching, as you can see with my hat. With right. The on it. So not not um, the Baltimore Orioles. That's that's a Blue Jay. <laughs> or the St. Louis Cardinals. Right? <laughs> yeah, or the, the Cardinals. Cardinals. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh. So uh, that's that's honestly how I transitioned to the career that I'm in right now. And uh, I tell you what, man, I couldn't be more happy. 
more yeah, yeah cool. it's cool it's really cool too like because i'm i'm like you i've always just been a sport like i watch basically anything uh sports right. but basket you know basketball is my favorite uh but i think it's really cool like obviously to follow you and, and and see you're always involved with the raptors like you said especially the bills i love your your videos oh. with your helmet on and all yeah. <laughs> yeah. but uh my heart is still healing man. My i know is- i know how about the game <laughs> speaking of football not to get off track here but how about the playoff games this year? They're unbelievable in the NFL. Like- Look, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. So not only do I have an investment in the sport, I have an investment in the team. If you're a person that's just a sports fan and don't really understand the game of football, you've turned into a football fan just by yes. watching the last three weeks of football games. It's been right? unreal. If you're looking for entertainment, there has been no better entertainment value in any sport you'd be you'd be able to watch than what the NFL has presented the last week. It's been it's incredible. True. I agree. Incredible. I agree. And I was gonna say too, uh, just going back onto your, uh, you know, how you found the media is, yeah, you got the 16 years of experience and you know your whole life you played hockey, you know. But uh, I think the biggest thing is your, your personality. I mean, you 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 communicate well. You got good energy. And naturally, that's you know probably one of the most important ingredients into in in that role. Would you say? It, it really is, Riley. And I tell you what, this thing that scared the shit out of me when I first got into this industry was you're talking on a live mic. Yeah. Okay. And you guys <laughs> both know being in a hockey locker room. <laughs> right. Yes. There is no proper language that is being <laughs> said. Right. So it's it's locker room talk. Yeah. And that was my biggest fear into transitioning into media was how how am I going to train myself to eliminate my locker room vocabulary? Yeah. Because literally every second word that comes out of your mouth, maybe even every third word, is <laughs> yeah. F this, F yeah. that, F <laughs> that. So doing it on a live mic, you don't want to slip up because, you know, we've seen what happened with people that speak yeah. on live mic. So it took a lot of discipline for me, but – the beauty about doing this job is like you said, is just having the fun conversations that people want to hear about your life experiences or mm-hmm. just even, you know, the, the, the locker room talk or the locker room stories. I mean, literally that's what sports talk radio has turned into. It's about here putting, putting the, the listener into the shoes of a real life athlete living through those situations. So that's what I really embraced throughout this transition was I didn't want to be one of those guys that would be given a note of script or a script of notes yeah. and just, okay, this is the way I've got to talk sports. No, that's, that's not my MO. Like you said, I, I always want to bring a fun approach to sports conversation and the more fun, the more laugh that you can have, but also the more educating you could be to the listener yeah, is right. what really, you know, you know, allow me attractive to you. And I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky that I, that I live and work in a market like Toronto that is so sports hungry when it comes to, you know, obviously the Maple Leafs, the Raptors, that my profile has given me a head start in this sure. market and in this industry, because I have, you know, the intangible, or at least not the intangible, the, the resume of playing, for the Maple Leafs, you know, people want to hear what that was like, you know, right, the right. draft stories, mm-hmm. playing with guys like Sundin and Tucker and Domi and those guys, all the greats, the Maple Leafs that Maple Leafs fans remember. So that's where I consider myself very lucky because if I would have been able, if I would have had to start this up in a different market where people actually had to know, get to know me first, yeah, probably wouldn't be, you know, around the success I've been able to have so far. So you know, and, and in life, and I tell, tell guys like this all the time, you know, that are still playing, have a purpose with everything you're doing when you're in the NHL. You know, be a, be a good teammate. You know, have, allow yourself to create, you know, amazing experiences. But not everything down. Because the one thing that I regret in Nasty, <laughs> you were one of the guys, I think, that was really good at this. You collected a lot of things 
from players that you worked with. And I don't know if yeah. you were did that or probably, but no, I, didn't. I sit here, I sit here at the end of my career and I've played with so many great players and I have nothing to show for it. Nothing. Like, and I know guys like not now you see guys on social media that every once in a while they're, they're, they're doing an exchange with, you know, a Jersey exchange or, a stick right. exchange or <clears throat> something with these guys. I wish I had something like with the Crosby, the Ovechkins, the Sundins, the, the Zetterbergs, the Datsuks, the Darus, the Voracek. Yeah, right. The, yeah. Let's go with Vinny LeCavalier, one of my yeah. big teammates in in Philadelphia. Like all, all, all I have to show from that is is just my words saying, Yeah, I play with those guys. Yeah. You're, just, you're trying to reminisce the stories and the great conversation you have with those guys. But I wish I had something sentimental to show because I just built a nice little, you know, man cave office down here. I'd love to have all those things yeah, all because yeah. it's it, it it represents you know the life and career that you live so right but, you know i tell players all the time like you know especially with social media maybe you don't have to be as vocal on social media but share your experiences on social media because yeah in post career you never know when something like that you know can come back and help you with, with whatever situation that you're in whether it's you know a job that you're trying to get or a story that you're trying to share Right. I, it's funny, Coco, you say that because I, I used to always be the guy with a camera, right? Oh, it yeah. does be like, Oh yeah. Nash. Fuck Nash. You're always taking pictures. <laughs> and then three days later, Hey, can you, can you, you send me those that, pictures? Yeah. Can yeah. you send me those yeah. pictures? Yeah. Oh, well, you, you want me to send them to you? And it's yeah. funny, like going through just over the years, I found these pictures from Claude Giroux's rookie party. Oh God. And oh, I mean, man. the pictures we have from that night, uh, Aaron Asham, no shirt on, oh. which should never happen. Ash <laughs> shouldn't happen, even when you were playing. No, public. Uh, but just some of the great pictures. Just, just over the years, you're right, man. I always try to keep things and collect things. I probably have way too much shit. Like it may life. not seem like much at the time, but right when 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 life passes you by, it means a lot when you go back and reflect. Like I just finished doing some rentals at my place and part of the process was decluttering yeah. yeah. and you just, you go back and you open up these Pandora boxes of yep. just, you know, articles or pictures or memorabilia. And you're like, wow, a time warp. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. It's a time warp. It's like, wow, that's pretty <laughs> it, awesome. it triggers like, things. You remember yeah, things that you oh, kind of yeah. just got put in the back of your head too. And you're oh, like, yeah. Oh, you start smiling. You're like, man, that was awesome. Those are good old days. Yeah. Like it, <laughs> it goes by so fast, man. Yeah. So fast. I was gonna say, Coco. You know, you, you you being born and raised in Toronto, and having been drafted by the Toronto Maple Leafs, playing six years there, and then in the Toronto media, that's got to be like, I say, a, a youth hockey player's dream of some sort, right? I mean, you kind of cover it all the bases. Really is. And I think you know, I look back in my career, and I was almost the um, the guy who kickstarted. You know the home homegrown a homegrown kid playing for the Maple Leafs. Yeah. You know the, the yeah. guy that I mean before my time I can't remember the Maple Leafs drafting uh, a local kid as their first round pick. And now it's like it's like so common where it's like almost every player you see play for the Maple Leafs nowadays has some sort of connection to growing up in Ontario. And so to me that's what I really pride myself in or not just I, I I sort of appreciate a lot more is that you know as much as I still think that my career probably could have gone differently if I started somewhere else and I don't say that disrespectfully I only say that because when I got drafted to the Maple Leafs I was a 19 year old kid and the next oldest guy in the in the dressing room was 28 years old right wow. so you can understand that you know, a team coached by Pat Quinn, and this is no shot at him. This is just who he was and how he coached. He loved having older players around. I mean, right. just he always put the trust and belief in, you know, veteran guys to go out and play the game and coach the the, the team the way, you know, the, the, or, the, or the, that would that would allow them to have the success because he'd just be a guy behind the bench just barking at the referees. And that's sort of one of my greatest memories of him is I don't really <laughs> remember being coached by I just remember him just constantly every game barking at the referees where, you know, it was the older guys like Sundin and, and Roberts and, and, and Domi, 
that would literally, you know, coach the team up, but they did it through experience and that's how much the game has changed. Yeah. Yeah. And so as much as I say that, how my career could have gone differently again, it's almost like things were meant to happen for a reason. I wouldn't be where I am in my career today. If I didn't have that experience of starting with the Maple Leafs the way that I did. Yeah. And if there's one regret that I have in my career, it's not a bad one. It's just, you know, I understand how important the Maple Leafs are to the city of Toronto, and you're seeing it now with, you know, the team they've been able to build and just the lack of success they've been able to have in the playoffs. That's my one regret of my time with the Maple Leafs is that I wish I would have been able to experience playoff hockey yeah. in Toronto because, you know, here you're you're a local celebrity, and that's yeah. that's what changed for me. Like, I was a 19-year-old just who loved to play the game of hockey. The minute I got drafted in Toronto Maple Leafs, my life changed in an instant. I just yeah. went, I went from a kid that just loved playing hockey to literally a local celebrity overnight where I came right. home and it's like my face was plastered all over the papers. I was being talked about nonstop on the TV and on the radios. And it's just like everywhere I went, you know, if you're if you were associated <laughs> with the name Cole Akabo, you were, you know, you were a star. People wanted to sit and talk to you and you know, talk about the Maple Leafs and stuff like that. And that's the good and the bad that comes with, you know, and I don't say bad in, in, in a bad way. It's just sometimes it can be much because yeah. you just, you want that separation between the life of hockey and life away from hockey where here it's almost impossible to have, but to a fault, you can't really blame that because you are who you are because of this, Yeah, you know, this, this attention, this team gets. So, um, yeah, I, that's that's sort of, you know, the way I've always labeled it is just grateful for my time here. Wish it could have gone a little differently, but also, you know, really happy that I was able to move on and find success and continue my career in other places. Yeah, I, it's got to be tough being 19 years old. Oh, I mean, man, I get, in Toronto. When, in <laughs> Toronto. I mean, yeah, I like, can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> nothing you could, nothing you could do to ever prepare yourself for that, right? You said, like, oh. you're just an average guy who loves hockey. Next day you're drafted. Next day you're you're you know you're the biggest thing in Toronto, essentially. Yeah. And you know, at 19, at years, 19 old, years old, trying to wrap your head around role. that, right? Like, and the pressure that surrounded that too. Oh my because god! I, can imagine. I, I was a really good junior player. I you know as you can see here with my Canadian jersey, yeah. representing Canada, and yeah, you know I've even my first training camp with the Maple Leafs, I led the team in scoring, and you're just you're you're trying to. You're trying to live up to those expectations. And I believe if I would have stayed healthy, I would have eaten, you know, I wouldn't say easily, but I would have been confident enough to live up to those expectations. But then when you start dealing with injuries and you're having people start labeling you a certain player that you're not, you know, I hated the word injury prone. And I would have phrased it as just bad luck that I was, you know, experiencing. And, you know, I think even throughout the, that turmoil that I, that I went through during those times, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have those experiences to per- persevere through. Because, right. you know, I, I, the great example that I share with a lot of kids is in life and especially in sport, you're never going to, you're never going to have the same path as somebody else. You're always going to be on your own path, whatever that may take, and however far that may go. It's the adversity and the perseverance that you that you allow yourself to overcome with the strength that you build from within knowing that if you just believe in, in, in yourself and what you want to accomplish, nothing on the outside can get in your way. And that was my motivation every summer. My motivation every summer when I put myself in those situations was just to prove people wrong and to prove myself right. Yep. And just yep. not let, you know, the names or the sticks and stones that people throw at me, you know, hold me down. Yeah, right. that's great advice. I mean, if you don't believe in yourself, who will really? I mean, right. you know, it's, right. you're trying to get the, well, not, you know, you're trying to get the fan base and the city <laughs> and everyone to rally around you. But you I mean, it's like, uh, like you said, everyone's past different. There's, there's, there's no doubt going to be adversity and bumps in the road. Right. I mean, you, oh. that's, that's, I mean, that's especially the- in today's world where the, the, Parity in hockey is so high when you talk about the separation between you and the next guy. Yeah. 
if you let the little bit of adversity get in your way, you know, who's, who's to say, or, you know, what's going to allow yourself to overcome that when they can just move on to the next guy. Right. Yeah. And cause like I said, if, if like, really, when you talk about the separation between the best players in the game and the, the average players in the game, it's really not that much of a difference when you think about it. So with the parody in hockey, you know, knowing that we're playing in a salary cap era, if you don't do anything with the chance that you're given, they're just going to move on to the next guy. That's it. Yeah. Right. That's right. And, and if they do move on to the next guy, which rarely happens, what are you doing to make sure that when that next chance comes, you're ready for it or you're more ready for it than you were the first time. So that to me is the difference between making it and not making it. When you really ask me, it's just, it's, it's understanding the role or at least the job that's required and finding a way to do it. Because when, when you have these guys that come up through the ranks and they've been, you know, top three, top six guys on every, every team they played on coming up, then they go, they get drafted to a team and, you know, that position isn't necessarily open for them right away. What do you do? You don't sit there and pout about it. You say, okay, well, what position can I play this year so I can be a big member of the team so that when that chance in the top three or top six opens up, I'm ready for it. Right. Some guys just don't know how to make that adjustment. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's, it's the mind, right? I mean, I, I think you, I, we talk about this quite a bit as far as, like, you know, the physical body and how, you know, how guys are training and the skill and all this stuff. But most of these guys, you know, high-end junior players and collegiate players, like, they don't really – have a whole lot of adversity maybe injuries and stuff like that but as far as like everything's been given to them so all of a sudden now they got to slot down a couple spots or maybe be scratched i mean god knows that's not the end of the world but a lot of these guys think it is they think it is but it's you know it's it's the mind it's the the ability to kind of see these problems and these challenges and, and be able to you know to wrap your head around them and then be okay with them and understand there's the growth that's will be in, in, in encompassed with it, you know, but I think that's part of the coach's job, you know, assistant coaches, a lot of times helping them make sense of that. But if you don't have that, you know, that uh, ability to make sense of it, I think that's where a lot of guys fall off. Like they're, they're so set on, like, I'm so just going to, I got drafted. Now I'm playing the NHL and, and, and then they, they really struggle. I mean, I, I coached for the, you know, the Phantoms for seven years and I, that's all I dealt with. You know, bring out the yeah. oven mitts and bring out the oven mitts and be like, you'll be all right. You're dude. talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> we, but, like, see the, but the thing is, Coach, is probably one of the, 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 the greatest things you learn is how valuable communication is. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right? Like, if you're not talking to these guys and you're not and, – and, and they're not gathering information and they're just constantly thinking about it, well, then they're lost. Yeah, because I feel like and this is the one thing that bothered me is later in my career where, you know, you went to get answers, but they just gave you what you wanted to hear or what Mm -hmm. they wanted you to hear instead of actually giving you the truth so that you can do something with the truth instead of just being told what you're told just so that you go away. Yeah, right. Yeah, like that's what bothered me the most. Like, tell me up front. And that's why I love Chief. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite coach is to play for and i tell this to everybody he wasn't the greatest x's and o's guy when it came to measuring him against other coaches that i play and that's not necessarily you know the 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 best asset it's the way you communicate with your players and chief was always 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 honest with me told me yeah. how, told me how it was and I, that's what i respect him. Yeah, he really liked you. He chief, he's always talked really good about you. And and even when you were there, I remember he just fucking loved you. You two would sit there and talk and you just hear him laughing and fuck he loved Coco. I came in as the eighth defenseman, right? So I could have easily been an afterthought. Right. But he made it a priority every day, knowing that is Lappy still there? Lappy's head coach of Lehigh. Oh. Yeah, in America. I love like, Lappy. Yeah. I couldn't fucking stand his bag skates. <laughs> <laughs> the guy 
never took a day off of doing it with me. And I'm like, dude, I haven't played in two months, man. Like, <laughs> give, me give me a breath. Give me a breath. Give me a bone, bone man. <laughs> yeah. And it's like the more the more I asked for that bone, the harder he made the skate. Oh, yeah. Man. And so, like, Chief Sounds recognized that. Right. Recognized yeah. the fact that, look, man, I've been – gonna grind man all i want to do is play and all i'm doing is getting bag skated every day like <laughs> yeah it's sucking the fun out of me but he made it a priority to make sure he came and talked to me almost every day and say hey man how are you doing how are you keeping like you know stay with it stay strong you know they're good your, your time's gonna come and to a point i actually called his bluff and i said dude stop bullshitting me man i know you're just saying that's your coach he goes no man i really believe it like I, you know yeah Love the fact that you're here. I love your positive attitude. Just keep going at it, even though things aren't good right now. And it goes a long way, man. When your coach has your back like that, oh, knowing yeah. that you know, the situation isn't the greatest, it's just, and that's honestly what made me continue to just, you know, try to be the, the fun guy around the room and keep things light, but also keep things professional. Yeah, you do. You definitely did. You, you became a team favor, like within a week of being here. Uh, we're in Philly. I remember your first day in Florida. Actually, I was telling Riley, I came across your first video, your first interview. You just come off the ice from a bag skate. Bag <laughs> skate. <laughs> it was the first day <laughs> you were in Florida. You actually look pretty good, though. You're not like, you're not all red and dying. But I was well, telling her. The good thing is, we were on the road. You had to kick us off. Yeah, exactly. Right? So you you only get the ice nice. for so long. But uh, the, I was watching the, <clears throat> listening to your first interview that day. And, um, I was telling Riles, you can hear my loud mouth. And if someone says something, hey, nah, something about Instagram, something about it. And I'm like, ah, and I'm like yelling. He can hear me in your mic as you're talking to those guys. But I was like, I remember Coco coming in and um, you were just the guys loved you right away. And that was the case everywhere, though. But uh, just kind of funny you, you said what, that about Chief because he really did like you. Like he was he, he really he really liked you a lot. And he always had a lot of good things to say. Yeah. And, and look, I'm, I'm grateful for Chief for, for saying that and, and developing that relationship with me because he went to bat for me. Like, I could have easily been put on waivers that year and, yeah. you know, go play in the minors, which is something an older guy never really wants to do. Like, I'd rather right. stick around and be a good team guy and, you know, at least, you know, travel with the boys, you know, have yeah. fun with the boys and battle with them in practice Yeah. than, uh, than, than have to do that. But uh, it's funny because um, – at the end of the year, I remember I walked into his office and, you know, even though my time was tough in Philly, I absolutely loved playing there. I loved it so much. I loved the group of guys that I was around, even though we didn't have much success. Right. And there was a lot of other politics that was going on behind the scenes with, you know, players contracts and player movements and, you know, team changing stuff like that. Nothing any of us could control. Right. Well, you talk about being around a group of guys. I don't think I've ever played with a better group of guys and feeling, or even surrounded myself with a better group of staff, including yourself, nasty. Thank you. Like, you know, with the guys that were there and it just, it, it, as much as bad as it was, it just, it made me want to come to the rink every day, knowing that regardless of what hockey was, I was laughing. I was having a good time. Yeah. And I was yeah. appreciating my time in the NHL. And I remember when I met when, after the year was over, I went into my meeting with chief, and Chief was, you know, his future was up in the air too. Like he didn't know yeah. if he was coming back or not. And I, I sat down and I said, look, I don't need you to tell me anything because obviously, you know, part of it's not your decision. But if you're back, I better fucking be back too. Yeah. And he, and he sort of, he, he chuckled at me. He goes, buddy, believe me, if I'm back, you're back. You're not going anywhere because uh, I love awesome. having that's you around. Awesome. Right. So that's sort of the relationship that we developed. And I'm so grateful for it. Cause even, even like when we, when we both separated, I mean, a couple of days later, they, they moved on from him. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of knew where my fate was, what, where, where that was. And I was still hopeful, but I remember going into Hexy's office and at the end of the year too. And I said, look, man, I'm really grateful that you guys brought me in for the chance that you gave me but I would love nothing more than to spend a full season as a Philadelphia flyer. Like, please allow me to have that opportunity. And he goes, Carlo, you represented yourself in this organization with first class. You know, I can't, I can't express to you the difficulties that I saw you go through, but also the work that you put in to make sure that you were ready. I don't think I've seen anybody do what you read. I said, 
look, if there's any chance for me to be back next year, just understand that I don't want any other, other any other uh, any other opportunity to come my way. If you're telling me now there's a chance to be back, please let's find a way to, to come back. And the thing he said to me was, look, we haven't made any decision yet. We've got eight guys on one-way contracts, so we've got to make some moves on the fence. But trust me, you'll be a guy that we think about bringing back. And I was like, okay, we'll leave it at that. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Two days later, as I'm driving home from Philly <laughs> at the end of the year, they sign Evgeny Medvedev from Russia – for three million bucks, I was like, Maddie. "What the fuck?" <laughs> I would have taken a third of that to come back. And at least you knew you had what you had. I was so pissed when that happened. Oh my it just, god! It just like I was like, I was like, I was like, okay, well, at least my fate is sealed. That there's probably a chance I'm not coming back. But <laughs> what I. Oh man, I was so mad. They just came out of Russia. I forgot like, about that. He uh, was well, Maddie, you can... Maddie looked like he was 24, but he was like 33. And like <laughs> this guy looked like he could lie about his age. He... That's funny, I Maddie. Didn't, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about Medvedev. I'm not yeah. sitting here, you know. No, no, I know. It's it's just funny that stuff you... like that. It's just like, dude, man, like you had I would have played the seventh defenseman. I would have been the same, you know, same guy, good locker room guy, fun to be around, competing my ass off, you know, play with passion in front of that amazing fan base. And it's just like, just like that. It's like they gave the guy three <laughs> times the money. 48 hours later. <laughs> 48 three hours. times the money and doesn't even Ru- play an NHL game. Ru- ruined oh, your drive right. home. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my God, man. I was an hour and a half into my, what, seven-hour drive home. I'm like. Pretty upbeat. Yeah, right. I'm in love with the Coco on yeah. the radio. And <laughs> you reek at the tweet. Uh, I was listening to the Delhi sound soundtracks. Like he gave me Delhi uh, Del Auto. His DJ, his DJ, um, yeah, DJ, whatever it is, he gave me. Yeah, oh, was- that's funny. Oh, Did you God. so back to Toronto real quick? Did you realize that you and uh, Riggs here were teammates at camp? Do you I remember? I did. It's actually funny you bring that up because I remember. At training camp, you came in and you like you made a statement in your first training camp. You went and started to fight everybody in camp. You were trying to take everybody's head off. I remember watching the fight of you and Darcy Tucker. I don't think Darcy knew anything about you. And like I don't think he did. Crazy tough, crazy (laughs) tough you were. But I do remember you getting hurt that one preseason. It was your shoulder or something that you ended up hurting. Yeah, I separated my shoulder. Yeah. You're the guy that introduced me to the UBE bike. Really? I don't remember body that. Bike? Oh, yeah, because, yeah. Because in your rehab, I'd come into the gym every day. You know, he'd have to walk through the gym to get to the dressing room. And you see Coach just there just busting his ass on the UBE bike. And I'm like, what is that? Like, he's <laughs> like, does that work? Yeah. Like, people are saying it's a bike for your upper body. And literally, who would have thought? I was like, okay, I'm going to go try this. You know what I mean? Like, I'm coming off of shoulder surgery myself, too. Dude, I bought a UBE bike. The <laughs> one, and it's because of coats. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure I want one of those in my house. Yeah, right. Yeah, I knew. That he was one tough sob that I didn't want. I was hoping he was on my team. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I don't know if you know <clears throat> the, the the backstory of what happened with the Tucker um, fight. There, um, it was it was honestly my first shift of the first day of camp. Hopped over the yeah, boards you and ran. Re- you ran, ran Travis, Travis Green, Green yeah. And then yeah. Tucker came over, um, and then whatever. It was like that'd be two punches, or whatever. But. Uh, after the, the inner squad, inner, the inner squad scrimmage, I was in the shower and I heard a bunch of yelling and screaming. I don't know which team you were on, if you even remember this or heard, heard this story. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? So I would towel off, go outside, and, and there's Domi, I think Belak, G- Gary Roberts, and they were like taming Darcy Tucker down. He was trying to come in the shower after me and, and try and fight me. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> oh yeah, it was like this big, this big thing. I'm like, geez, I'm like, you I mean, I mean, I, I know, I know, I beat him up, but like, you I mean, can't you just let it go? You know, was on. He was not happy. Not happy about it. <laughs> and then later in the day, because this was, I think, Cops Coliseum, was it not? It was Coliseum, Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was waiting for the elevator. I think it was the next day or some. 
And I'm just waiting there, sitting there with my, you know, kind of my head down. And then, and then here comes Tux, like flying around. You could kind of come use the elevator and, and he looks at me. And then he like has this like unsure like, look on his I face. Look? And then yeah. he like 180s and it goes back the other way. I'm like, dude, man, I'm like, we could be buddies, you know. It's like, I'm just coming here. <laughs> I just came here to try and yeah. do my job, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I had a great experience in, in, in Toronto. Well, you signing. worked your way. I don't know if you came in on a contract. No, but you definitely signed a contract after that camp. Didn't I you? did, yeah, with uh, with yeah, St. John's. You did what you had to do, man. Yep, and then man, yeah. man, spent most of the year in uh, the Central Hockey League, won a championship down there, and then just kept fighting the mutants down there <laughs> and mutant after mutant and Dude, <laughs> league after league. You know what? I give you a lot of credit, man. Nobody really appreciates the tough guy role because that's a hard life, man. It's a hard life. And to see what you've done post-career to yourself, God bless you, man. So happy for you. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, it's definitely not uh, not an easy road. Uh, transition. But, um, no. but uh, you know, it's But funny. I tell you what, man, some of the best guys you'll meet in hockey are the guys that played the tough guy role. Oh, I yeah. Agree best that. guys. Yeah, best guys sure. you'll ever meet. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, just appreciate the little things and you know, the appreciate the little wins here and there. And, you know, just uh, the fact that you could live your childhood dream and, you know, find you still find your way and find, you know, find your path doing something yeah. a little bit unorthodox, like fighting regularly is, you know, <laughs> that wasn't certainly part of uh, the game plan growing up. But <laughs> um, but uh, I'm thankful for it. Kind of like you were talking about earlier. I'm just so thankful the way everything worked out uh, into my in my playing career, which wasn't overly significant in the grand scheme of, you know, NHL careers, but uh, it certainly put me on the path that I needed to be post career and mm. thankful for all the punches to the head. Cause I wouldn't be in the space. Well, I think about either, it, you know, think about it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you've done a good job at least, uh, you know, uh, healing your brain. Yeah. Um, you know, like I mentioned to you earlier, I mean, I don't know if this is a nice plug we should be giving on this podcast, but oh, uh, yeah. definitely it's, buying yeah. into your uh, CBD product because I'm trying to heal myself in my post career too. But, you know, you think about the generations of hockey and, you know, the, the, the time you came into the league where fighting was acceptable. Yeah. It was a tough man's game. Yep. I mean, could you imagine being a tough guy in today's game and trying to make the NHL? Good luck. Tough, yeah, no, no chance, really. I mean, luck. But, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, the game's changed so much. Yeah, I was kind of like the tail end of, I would say, the tail end of like absolute meathead, uh, you yeah. know, yeah. meatheads uh, on teams. Fuck, and- man, I, I know I shouldn't be swearing, but it's just it's hard not <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah. I, I know coming up into the league, like I prided myself in playing with my heart on my sleeve. Like I was a really reckless player, but I loved the physical contact of the game. And part of the reason why I did, because I wore those Douglas shoulder pads. Yeah. Just, you felt like you were like invincible wearing those Douglas shoulder. And then when the league changed the rule to get rid of those, yeah, I, I, that was a complete need. Like I, <laughs> I couldn't play the game. I couldn't, everything hurt. Everything yeah. hurts. <laughs> you run into the boards, everything hurt. But the thing is, wearing those shoulder pads actually helped me survive the game because, like, if you play like second or third pairing back in the day, you're playing against every other team's third and fourth lines. Yeah. And what are those third and fourth lines going to do? Trying to run, run you through the sure. corner. And just, and the worst rule change the NHL made was putting those stupid trapezoids in the corners. Because then the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the goalies couldn't come out and play the puck. And I'm thinking to myself, fuck, I got to go back and get that puck now. Clearly, <laughs> I, I would make a deal with my, with my goalie that I'm playing with. And like some guys knew how to play the puck, some guys didn't know how to play the puck. And I was always telling them, look, man, if the puck gets dumped in and I'm on the ice with third and fourth, like, come out and stop it and play it. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to come back and get it. <laughs> you know, it's like, but oh, the game's man. changed so much. Oh, right so now. much, hasn't it? Yeah, speaking of going into corners, one of the best videos ever. You posted it for Christmas <laughs> as a gift. Is <laughs> when you you dove for Bill Terry, Phil Pilla, and you come up. I showed it to Elvis this morning, and I thought he had seen it. He was he must have watched it ten times all the way to school. He kept watching it. Oh, it's so uh, good. honestly, dude. The Koliakovo cam. 
<laughs> corner right, camp. Exactly. <laughs> it should if there's a loo for hockey, it should be hung in the loo. Like that picture alone or that gift, even yeah. though there's not a loo, it should go into the Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, man, it's I the agree. best. So like, good. Think about think about like <laughs> the science behind that, okay? How, and, and this was the thing that amazed me the most when I saw it. I was like, how the fuck was the camera right there to get the square part of my face that's up against the glass like this? The best look. Glass, and I mean, I'm not going to sit there and be mad or embarrassed about it. All I'm no. going to do is sit there and laugh about it. It's yes, unbelievable. It. Hilarious. Dude, but it's almost people, like you came up and saw it like, oh. Well, but here's the thing, Nasty. I, I tried to explain to people because they asked me about all the time, like, how did how did you do that? Like, did you know the camera's there? It's like, no, I don't know the camera. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to play, trying to play, stopping the guy in a breakaway. <laughs> but you guys know from playing in the old Joe Louis Arena, okay? Those boards are not boards; they're brick walls. Yeah, okay? brick walls. So when I'm making that play. I know I'm going to slide into the boards. And all I keep thinking to myself is don't go head first. Try to get myself up so I can at least embrace the impact on yeah. the, the brick walls. The problem was when I did that, your knee pads they or your knees get exposed to the lower dasher. Yeah. So you, you stand up against the wall. Next thing you know, your knees are going in hard against that brick wall, which is why I made that face like, ah, uh, fuck. It was a classic it's face. The greatest. Oh, the best. And so, yeah, it was, it was absolutely amazing. Oh, and it's, man. I don't think there'll ever be a gift that replicates. I, I don't think I so love, either. I love how you. That one is. I know. I love how you posted it. Is I'm gonna give you the gift yeah. for Christmas. Yeah, and, from all gifts. yeah it's the best, man. <laughs> Oh, Here's so the funny good. thing about it, about that clip too is, I think we lost that game, and yeah, we did. It was in Detroit. We probably lost that game. You know, it was one of my favorite rinks to play, and I love playing in Joe Louis Arena, which is why I was so pumped when I signed there. Um, but in the post game, when everybody's you know showering up, I'm you know just walking around and trying to dissect the game we just lost. So I come out of the shower, and walking over to my stall, putting my clothes on. And in the other corner, there's like six guys hovered around in a circle and they're just <laughs> dying of laughter. <laughs> so I'm like, we just lost. Like, should guys be really like mm. dying of laughter that much in our room? So I put my clothes on and I walk by. And as I'm walking by, you can see like guys just peeking with their eyes and be like, oh, shh, don't think we need to walk. So I'm like, okay, what's up? Like, what's the joke? And uh, I don't know who it was. It must, it must have been Andy McDonald or something. He looks at me and he goes, have you seen this? I was like, seen what? And they showed me the video and I was like, holy <laughs> how, did, how did they get that on video? <laughs> and so I, I could do nothing. Like, one, I was embarrassed and they were embarrassed at laughing at me. And I was trying to tell them, like, guys, don't be embarrassed laughing. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. That happened. <laughs> yeah. So we had a couple of guys that weren't playing in that game. So the next day at the rink, as soon as those guys saw me, they just started dying of laughing. They come checking my face. I'm like, oh, man, are you okay? Did you break anything? <laughs> I'm never going to hear the end of this. It's oh, just it's my God. one of the greatest face plants of all time. Oh, in the Hall man. Of that was it's just oh, one of the funniest. Classic video. Man. I had forgotten about that until you posted it again. I was just dying. <laughs> but that's this the, the best. Thing. That's the thing. Every year. I get more comments from people saying, oh, my God, I can't believe I didn't see this. This is the yeah. best thing I've ever seen. But now, like, the funny thing is, is that people will chirp me on Twitter just by sending me the gift. Oh, right? yeah. When, when I make awesome. it, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, re I reply Thumbs happy up. face. Like, the yeah, yeah, say, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, it's funny, man. Good job. You got me. Oh, it's so, the best. It's a great clip, man. That's the thing I've learned, right? Like, the, the, the best thing you can do in those situations is join along in the laugh. How fun were they? You got yeah. it, right? Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if you make being fun rigid. of yourself while people yeah. are trying to make fun of you, they got no comeback. Yeah, yeah exactly. No comeback. Yeah, as soon as you yeah. come rigid with it and get like annoyed with it, and then you're going to have like a thousand more people come at you. You got to make fun of yourself and have right. fun with it. It's classic. Uh, hey, Coco, I was um, speaking when you were just talking about uh, you were hoping to play the Olympics years ago. <clears throat> I saw... Uh, 
Uppy and uh, Obes had a had a list up, and you were on the <laughs> list this year. Yeah, I saw. And I'm looking at this list, so I'm like, can you imagine <laughs> the boys? It's got a three week training camp, trying to get themselves in shape. Like how well? Dude. Like, you know, just the experience. Need, oh, of course, yeah. No. I know. I, I need more than three weeks to get <laughs> <through>. <laughs> more than three weeks. Right yeah. now. I, I don't think I haven't done any exercise, and I'm not proud to say this. I'm actually embarrassed to say this. I'm going to say in probably two years. Really? And well, you've been I locked just, down for God's sakes. You guys can't. I mean, you can I mean, still I can't exercise. go to a gym. I got my kids yep. home all the time. I work in the mornings at night. I just want to chillax, and it's just. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I'd love to get a few <laughs> LBs, but eventually I will. But that that picture or that lineup that they first released, I had to take a second look at it in the beginning because it had the PSN name on the bottom of it. Yeah. I'm like, who made this list? Was it these guys that made it or was yeah. it yeah. my employer, TSN? So I'm, I'm going to TSN Instagram. I'm calling my I go, <laughs> And so when everyone's like, no, I'm like, oh, wow, these guys got well, good because they then I'm going like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on board with this with this joke. Yeah. And so I posted on my social media, dude, I cannot tell you how many people <laughs> sent me a message saying, oh, my God, that's amazing. Congrats. I can't believe <laughs> yeah, congrats. And all I said that my first response to most people was take a look at who the goalie is. <laughs> Freddie Brathwaite is 50 <laughs> years old. <laughs> like, you really think this is a team? <laughs> you know, I forgot about that until you just said that. I, I barely looked at that, but I did notice but it. It was, it was, oh, it was I contacted Obes. I, I messaged Obes and, and Appy. I was like, boys, good job, man. Yeah. You guys got that. It was a like, that was guy. really good. laughing about it, too. Even though, like, you know, you look at the names on that list, I mean, we joke about it. I think we could have meddled for sure if we were. Yeah, right. You know, that was an actual team. Yeah, so, for sure. That was, that was but, great. Uh, <clears throat> absolute beauties, man. Beauties. And then, yeah. oh, that's what I love seeing, too. Like, I love seeing guys that I know were funny guys and good guys when I played share stories like that. Yeah. Or, you know, get on the podcasts or, you know, do their own thing in the media because – like social media has given us such a, a great resource for people to just share right. certain, certain yeah. things like that. And you guys would know, like there's some guys that just aren't comfortable either talking or being on a mic or sharing stories, but you know, you know, there's certain things that you can say, certain things that you can share that people would love to hear because, yeah. Yeah. you know, as much as we say, you know, and I say this, that, social media has been a blessing and a curse in our life. It's been a yeah. blessing because it's just so easy to, to get in touch with somebody and so easy to just get information when you're, when you need it. But it's also been a curse because of some of the things you see on there. Some yeah. of the things that yeah. you read. So, but yeah, so that's our world right now. Yeah, it is a little bit of a distraction. Yeah. You gets it's a tool, right? Like anytime you have a tool, you have to figure out the proper way to use it. And then if you exactly. use, if misuse the tool, then it goes the other way, right? So I think, he knows what tool he uses really well. <laughs> that skate sharpener. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm on it a lot. Yes, you are. <laughs> it's, oh, I man. missed those five eights. Not five eights. It was half inch, I think you did. Yeah, half my, inch. My blades. Yeah. Half inch. Oh, that's so. funny, man. But it's so, funny. I learned a lot. So I learned, so sorry, coach. I learned a lot about skate sharpening, not just from you, but from my time in Europe, because I think on the NHL ice, I was using maybe three quarter inch. Don't really remember. It's been a while since I put my skates on, but when I got to Europe playing on the bigger ice and having to skate a lot more, dude, I'd leave every game having to ice my groins and my hips. And I'm like, like, what the? F I I train hard. I ride the bike. I stretch. I do band work and stuff like that. I do everything for warm up and post game. Why the hell do my groins hurt so much? <laughs> so my trainer there, um, uh, what's his name again? Oh, he's gonna kill me for forgetting his name. Tom Sevy. You know. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Sevy. Uh, yeah, Sevy. Yes, beauty, absolute yeah. beauty. So glad he was there. He looked at my skates and he goes. 
well, your groins are probably hurting because you're using a sharper edge. Yep. I was like, what the hell does that mean? He goes, well, you're <laughs> digging into the ice more, which means you're making your legs work a lot harder, harder than they need to. Yep. Dude, he put me on half of inch and I started gliding out there. I was yeah. like, holy shit, this is unreal. My groin's never hurt it again. I felt like I was speedy Gonzalez out there. It was yeah, unbelievable. Really <laughs> and honestly, like, I don't know if you educate guys about, you know, their different edges or hollows that they can use. Now, I can't believe the blades that they use where they just clip in yeah. and clip out. But <clears throat> shit, I wish I would have known that playing in the NHL. Maybe it could have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, it's true. I do. More. I try to tell people, especially like bigger guys, men's league guys, they've always done half like or or deeper, uh, half inch or deeper. And I'm always like, you don't need to be that deep because yeah. you weigh plenty. Yeah. Like right. you're digging into the ice. Yeah. You're just working. Your groins are going to hurt your hip. Just like you said, Coco, your hip. So what's, what's, what's the, what's the lighter? Is it seven eighths? Uh, yeah. Seven eighths, almost an inch. Yeah, right. it's yeah. Well, so that's you, I think what well, that's what I think I transitioned to in Europe. Yeah, exactly. You went yes for sure, and uh, it, it definitely would help. I mean, Paul Coffey skated on. You can't even. There's not even a number for it. It was so flat. Really? Of course, Coff never stopped. You know, yeah, you always yeah, notice Coff right. <laughs> circle like he never really Circling. came to a stop. Yeah. But watching him yeah. skate was un unbelievable, and he. Barely had any hollow in his uh, blades, which was it was you amazing. You think Macar skates on right now? Oh, oh man, my God! Whatever he skates on is <laughs> it's, that kid's unreal, man. He's God. skating on water, just yeah, no, glides it everywhere. Like. It's, it's unbelievable. Like... He's unbelievable. What's uh, real quick? Uh, you know, I know you cover Montreal there. Like it's kind of a been a shit show this year for them, dude. It has been. Like shit shows, I think is an understatement. <laughs> yeah. It's been just, it's been rough, man. And so I kind of expected that they were going to take a step back because, you know, clearly they caught lightning in a bottle last year going to the Stanley Cup final. Um, and they did it because, you know, they, Carey Price got hot and they just found a recipe to frustrate teams and, and, you know, be opportunistic. They score a goal and you saw their record last year when they would score the first goal, they were barely unbeatable. Right. Um, and part of the reason for that is because I never thought they were built to be a good regular season team because they couldn't really score much, but they clearly were built to be a good playoff team with, you know, the, the defense that they built with guys that, you know, just play sound positionally and, you know, in your yeah. face, make it tough to play in front of the net. And when you got Carey Price back there, it makes yeah. life even more yeah. difficult. And so, you know, they've had probably the craziest off season, any team that has just gone to the Stanley cup final that could have, um, you know, you carry price. Yeah. Voluntarily exposes himself to the expansion draft. You lose Philip Deno. You lose Shea Weber. You lose just Barry Cock and Yemi. Yeah. You know, you start the year without Edmondson. You start the year without Carey Price. Jeff Petrie is looking like a house league player this year, which he was a Norris Trophy candidate last year. Yeah, asked I me. know. Yeah. You know, Gallagher, you know, as, as much as a heartbeat he is, he's, you know, he's been beat up, hasn't really yeah. found his, his stride. And, so you kind of expected that there was going to be a drop off and you know, Cole Caulfield is another great example. This guy was the, the runaway leader yeah. for rookie of the year this year. And he's got one goal in the season. So wow, a lot has gone wrong. And for a guy that actually broadcasts their game, I walk into some nights just begging for a storyline to pop out of me because I'm trying to be positive about it. Right. And try to find the good because I don't really like, you know, beating people up with negative comments. And then you watch their game and it's just so lifeless. Yeah. You know, I, somebody said it best this morning. I think it was Drager. We had him on our show. Like, where's the emotional investment for these guys? They've got 38 games left. Yeah, right. You know, like I understand that like, you, you can play bad season, have bad games, but you can still have some pride in yourself knowing that you're in the NHL, you're playing for the Montreal Canadiens and just going out and competing. And that's, I think, the one thing that's really frustrating when you watch this Montreal team is just, they've got no, they play with no pride and yeah. granted, I, they've, they've had a lot of man games. They, they lead the league in man games, but it's been tough, man. It's been absolutely tough. And maybe this was, you know, 
a blessing for them, knowing that, you know, considering Bergevin's contract was up, which clearly he didn't resign, you have a new guy coming in, and maybe you maxed out your potential with the group that you had with your run to the final last year. Yeah. Yeah. So this, <clears throat> this just allowed him to say, you know what? Well, okay, we maxed out with this group. It's time for us to turn the page, but you talk about reshaping that roster. Good luck. Yeah. Who's going to yeah. take those contracts that they have? You know, it's not just the numbers that they make. It's the term that carries, you know, the, the number along with it. So, um, we'll see what happens, but you know, if they get the number one pick this year, you know, it can accelerate their rebuild maybe a little bit because you'll be getting a good player like right. Shane Wright if they win that. You know, you add him to a Suzuki and a Caulfield and you surround him with vets like Gallagher and Anderson and um, Toffoli. Yeah. Maybe they can turn it around quickly, but I think it's going to be a couple years. I think a lot of their success, definitely not this year, but in the coming years, will be whether or not Carey Price is there or not. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna Good say point. that. Yeah, the, um, have you had a chance to watch the Flyers at all? I know you watch a lot of you know everything, but uh, it's it's been a tough year here, dude. I can't believe it, man. Yeah, like the Flyers have been one of the most surprising teams for me this year because I really liked the moves they made in the off season. You know, bringing in Ryan Ellis. I know he hasn't been healthy this year. I'm a big fan of Rasmus Ristolainen, and I played with him in Buffalo. Yeah. Um, I just think he brings a certain element to every team that he plays on that, you know, teams lack where it's, he doesn't do anything flashy. He's not the guy that's going to take over a game, but he's definitely a guy that's going to make the game hard on some guys yeah. you know, that he plays against. Um, I love the Cam Atkinson move, even though it meant, you know, parting ways with Jake Voracek and just the pieces that they had there already with like Drew still being there, Poots is, uh, you know, missed most of the season. That's been yeah. unfortunate. You know, JVR, you know, you've had some young players like Farabee and Connect needed to that group. I, to me, I just, I'm blown away how bad they've been this year. And I don't really understand it. I know there was some people that were in favor of the coaching change and some people that were not in favor of the coaching change because they didn't think that coaching was the problem. There it was more, more of a personnel problem, but you know, that's been my beef with the NHL and the way they ought the salary cap, cap operates is, you know, what makes other sports exciting, like the NFL, like the NBA, and like baseball, is when those teams want to make a trade, they can make a trade. Yeah, yeah. In the NHL, like the team you put together to be in the season, you better hope it works out because if it doesn't, they're stuck. Yeah. And yeah. I hate, hate the way the NHL is transitioning where, you know, if you can't make a move, okay, let's fire our coach and see if that'll create a spark. Well, clearly it hasn't done that in, in Philly. And maybe it's done it in Vancouver with Boudreaux. But, you know, teams should be allowed in season to try to fix their mistakes and maybe create a spark with the player boom. But the salary cap makes it so challenging it to do so. And I'm, not, yep. and I'm not saying scrap the salary cap because I think the salary cap has done some good things for the game of hockey. Right. It's allowed, I think it's allowed players to make way more money because you're asking every team to spend a certain amount. You're seeing, you know, parity in the league, which some people will agree is good, some people will agree it's bad, but it's created healthier competition, is what I like to say. Right. But there's gotta be a mechanism within the salary cap that allows you to have some flexibility with player movements. I mean, Edmonton's a great example. Edmonton. Yeah. They're talking about firing their coach. Well, you, if you watch the way Edmonton play, they weren't giving up on their coach. They weren't losing games because right. the effort was. They were losing games because they were having goalie problems. They had injury yeah. problems. And <clears throat> maybe if there was a way to supplement that, maybe the streak wouldn't have gone so bad. So what do they resort to? They resort to taking a chance on a guy like Evander King because he's available. And they're saying, well, for the for the risk that we're about to take, if it if it if it um, if it just you know at least buys the success that we hope to vision, well then it was worth the risk. I just think you look at Philly. There's about a handful of moves I would say right now they would have loved to make, but can't. And yeah. Yeah. you can compare their same situation to Edmonton's situation. Carter Hart, you know, took the league by storm when he first came in. Maybe it was the you know the the rookie you know. Um, 
um, spark that some guys sort of play with. But was it forced in? You know, are you force feeding him now? You know, because he's such a young age, and then when he's not making saves and he's not winning games, now the pressure starts to mount a little more. Okay, you go out and get Martin Jones, but Martin Jones didn't have a great uh, track record of being a guy in the last couple of years that can win you hockey games. So now you start dealing with you know a confidence issue, and clearly they have none of it right now. Yeah, it's it's been tough. They they've just talk about injuries, man. It's 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 crazy what they're missing, especially injuries in the and COVID. Yeah, you know, I mean, the other thing too, right? No, nobody anticipated you this that this year's league was season was going to be impacted by COVID. I know. And even even at certain times during the season, before they addressed it, you weren't allowed any flexibility with some of these COVID issues that teams were were having. So yeah, I love buzz. I love excitement. I love player movement. Just because I'm a fan now, even when I was playing, I loved it because it's something that always allows you a chance to improve within the season. If you can't, and right. clearly you can't right now. Yeah, it's, I don't know what they're going to do. You know, it's G has a no trade, so it'll be interesting to see. Well, what do uh, you guys think is going to happen? I mean, I think, you know, you talk about the G situation. I love the guy. I think, you yeah. know, I've, I've commented on this, that if you're looking for a guy, like a true leader, this guy represents everything that you want in a leader, just because of how much he cares about the game, how he competes in practice, how he takes care of himself. You know, the passion that he plays with. And honestly, I think, you know, I think he should think long and hard about moving on this year. Yeah. Yeah. As much as the hard as as hard as that may seem to, you know, to realize in his own this guy deserves a chance to win and play in the playoffs and compete for Stanley Cup. He's earned that. Yeah. And I hope he understands that. And I hope, you know, obviously the team came out and said it'll be his choice because you know, you, there comes a point in your career where, you know, sometimes you get too comfortable with where you're at, but being that comfortable doesn't necessarily allow you to to have the results that you envision because of the team that you're on. This is a yeah. great opportunity for him to pick where he wants to go, right? Yeah. right? And, you know, envision that success somewhere else. And I know he's got a young family now, and I'm happy for him for doing that, but, you know, I still look at him as a really important piece that any team can add. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, for you guys sure. Yeah, well, that, that's kind of we, the way we've been thinking lately. When they went on their first ten game losing streak, we were t- had this discussion a, a lot around like you know what's G's fate here, and then we're like, well, it's still you know, how many games? There's a lot there? left. It's still like sixty games yeah. left. Or like it's too, well, too early to kind of you know go that direction. And then they you know they they did the coaching change, and then they what they, they went on a little roll, a little roll there, point seven, seven games. games. Yeah. And then they went on this 13 game losing streak again. Amazing how two teams can have two different 10 game losing streaks. Oh my God. It's right. Crazy. And, and then, then, then the conversation has been like, well, you know, I, I think this is like very clear now. G needs to, G needs to move on. It's almost yeah. like G deserves much better. I kind of, what you alluded to, like he's, he's, he's paid his dues. He's a high end player. He will compliment any team. That he'd go, yeah. he'd go to, and, and not be the the go to number one guy. I mean, what is he? Thirty four years old. Yeah. I mean, and not many teams. The thirty four year old is is still the, the highest producing player. You know what I mean? It's it's usually he is young, here. He is here, but yeah. he would go somewhere well, else. And it's funny you say that, uh, Coates, because the scenario I envision for him is a, a Phil Kessel scenario when he got traded to Pittsburgh. Hmm. Just yep. find a spot on a team where you can be an important supplementary piece. Yes. Because yes. You, put jo- you put Claude Giroux on a second or third line with any other teams. Oh, my God. Us. Yeah. It's you over. Know, to think that he – to think to put that pressure on himself to go somewhere else as competitive as he is to lead a team, I think that would be an unfair situation for him to put himself into. Yeah. Just I go agree. out and be part of a, a group – that is, you know, just a supplementary piece. Yep. Look, look what Phil Kessel helped the Pittsburgh Penguins do, playing on that third yep. line. Remember that HBK line? Mm-hmm. Well, yep. can match up with them. Right? Exactly. Right? So, it's kind of like Carts and Ritchie back in the day, too, right? At a younger right. age. Yeah, you go and you be like a secondary third right. guy and no, pre- no right. real pressure. You just go and play your game and kind of hide a little bit. <laughs> <in> <laughs> exactly. Sense, and a yeah. funny story about G, and this, this, will, this is what will make people really appreciate his competitiveness and, you know, 
even just his practice habit. You know me when I came in, f- practice was my games. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, I just wanted to have fun with practice, even though it was crazy to think that Chief ran the exact same practices every day, which is... <laughs> 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 I've never seen that done before, but literally you could, you could sleepwalk through most of his practices and that's not a knock on him. You know, the point of doing that was to create, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Oh God. Uh, repetition. He wanted to, what's that? Repetition. No, it was, uh, Oh man, God, I'm drawing a blank right now. Um, he wanted to create, you know, certain game habits, right? Where it, it was, you know, you're 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 really, you're not thinking when you grow out there. You're acting on instincts. Instinct, God, yeah. I can't believe I'm thinking. I'm not can't believe I'm forgetting the word. But anyways, I remember in in one of those practices, you know, I'm I'm goofing around a little bit, and, you know, having some fun, making big plays. And I remember stopping Gene on a two on one, and I just kind of like. Got the board, the puck in the boards, and I'm like, "Yeah, baby, can't beat me." You know, something <laughs> like that. He skated up to me like with the meanest face, like really wanted to like spear me, like kill me. Practice, and I was like, "Whoa, dude, man, relax. Like it's practice. I don't care if it's practice. Don't make fun of me like that." He's like in my grill, and I'm like, oh, "Okay." So I turn over to the group, and I was like, "G, okay today?" <laughs> Everyone's like. That's just Gene practice. Yeah. And then when he skates up to the center ice dot, he's staring me down and like just <laughs> oh, you know, like just giving me the the the, the mumbling, like the motherfucking mumbling. Stuff like like that. Motherfucker. And I was like, whoa, okay, dude. Like next time you come down on me, I'll just let you score. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but it it yeah. goes to show and then like the rest of the practice, he would like take slap shots at me and stuff like that. And it, what I really didn't process was that was just his competitive edge. He yeah, wanted yeah. to treat practice like a game. And, you know, that's a big credit to him. You know? And, you know, because he's he brings that competitive spirit in, in practices every day. And when we got off the ice, like, we joked about it and stuff. Yeah. Not like, you know. He's holding grudges. Uh, yeah. He holds grudges or anything like that. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, so that's 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 why I really hope, like, I really appreciated the chance to play with him and get to know him and stuff like that. But I really hope for his sake, he puts himself in a great opportunity to win because there's just guys in the game that you really cheer for because they're good guys. And he's 100%. Like, yeah. yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, what an addition he would be, you know, having a pastor like that, a ton of experience, you know. To the to, dude, you know, we always talk about maybe yeah, going man. to St. Louis or something like that. You know, Chief would yeah. be all over that. You know, oh, having a guy like Chief oh, loves Chief. Yeah, you oh, had you God. had him to that lineup. Wow. Uh, yeah, they're deep as it is right now. Yeah, he put them all up. Yeah, no yeah, doubt for sure. Chief, what a beauty! I was so pumped when he won the Stanley Cup, man. Yeah, oh, the Blues. Man. No was kidding. Great. We were pumped uh, too. I mean, obviously, you know, my ties with St. Louis, you know, helped add to it, but just the fact that he was the guy leading them. Yeah, I agree. Just amazing because he's just such a likable guy. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah he he's a beauty, yeah. man. Yeah. He is he, <laughs> he is a he's a beautiful human being, man. Uh Coco, man, we can't thank you enough for, for taking the time out. We know how busy you are. You got the kids at home. You're on the radio all morning. You well, good thing all, they're in, they're back in school now, so I got oh, a little are they bit back of in school. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, good for them. Back, uh, they went back to school, so that's why I had time this morning. Yeah, that's guys. awesome. <laughs> you know? That's awesome. Uh, Take advantage. Like the best part about now is this is this has been fun catching up with you guys, but. I'll turn off my computer and I'll just listen to the sound of silence. There you go. <laughs> Enjoy it. It's That's magical. awesome, man. Dude, we, we can't thank you enough. Seriously, Coco. Yeah. Appreciate oh, honestly, it. Man, my pleasure. Yeah. Good catching up with you boys. Love what you guys are doing. Stay Thanks, inside, man. man. All Thanks. right, brother. All right. Take care, boys. Nasty yeah. knuckles yeah. right there, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> that episode was brought to you by our friends at Fans of Philly. Fansofphilly.com. They do an amazing job putting together experiences on the road yes. for Flyers, Eagles, Phillies, the whole bit. And we had the opportunity to cruise with them to Arizona. Yep. Looking forward to March where we're Smashville. heading to Smashville. 500 oh, other I Philly fans. Wait. I can't wait just for you to have to stay up late. Dude, I lasted you in Arizona. 
You were you were the one yawning all night. Oh my trying boys, to sleep, trying to sneak, that, sneak I was away. hanging with Fitty. <laughs> Fifty Cent and I was Jumbo right there with and Radko. You. I was right there with you. You were squ losing squash. your mind. Like anyway, sardine. fans of Philly, they're the greatest. <laughs> it's an awesome time. If you could, I don't know if they have room. They got like there's 500 already, maybe even more by yeah, by I'm now. Sure but uh, even though the season is has not gone the way we want, fans of Philly is still fun. We were I went to Long Island with them. You yeah, weren't able to go, did. but. Uh, it's it's a great time. They put such a great show on it and, and do everything the right way. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's sure. it's great. Um, I can't wait for for Nashville though. Yeah, it's gonna I'm be awesome. Forward to it too. And a huge thank you to our guest Carlo Coliacovo. Coco, awesome dude. Nice to reconnect with him. Yeah, he's a he's, he's a, a really funny guy. Yeah, um, he was a he was a he was a team favorite. Like one, as soon as he got here, within a couple of days, just a funny guy. Always just jokes and. I did forget to bring up with him. We got him with the old baby powder in the in the hair dryer. Oh, he did. Because he was one guy that still <laughs> dried his hair. <laughs> and we got the. the dryer, I forgot. Man. I may even have that video oh, somewhere God. because I videoed it. it. But it was. He loved it too. He oh. turned that thing on. <laughs> oh. the uh, baby powder. I didn't even know face. guys still used. Oh uh, well, you he was me? like the only guy he was <laughs> using. Was and I think around. Claude actually. I think it was G. Was like we gotta get him with the oh, man, that's old dryer. Classic. But. Um, you know what? He 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 was a great guy. He came in um, seventh, eighth defenseman, yeah. and Chief really did like him. And and I remember Chief going to him saying, "Hey, like we're really gonna lean on you here at the end of the year." Um, we weren't all the way out of it um, when he got here, uh, you know, that that season. But he he worked really hard and got in really good shape, and um, he did play uh, some games and and the guys just loved him yeah. more than anything. And he was a good player too, like he said, you know, like. He felt like his career could have gone different ways, but he he did have, um, you know, he had some bad injuries. Yeah, some major injuries he, for sure, and, and that yeah. sucks for for anyone. But uh, great guy, great teammate. Yeah, was just just a really fun guy to be around. Hundred percent. You can see why Chief, you know, connected with him. You yeah. know, and, and having an eighth defenseman has a good attitude, makes it easier for the coach, yeah. makes it easier for him to communicate with him, and then and therefore you know you know Carlo kind of talked about it. You know the, the fact that he felt heard and felt you know they felt communicated yeah. with by chief so it goes you know it goes hand in hand the fact that he was a veteran guy eighth seated defenseman and to have come in and have a, a good attitude yeah. certainly makes it a lot easier for the coaching staff to put you in when the time is you know when the exactly. time comes and and you know, on, on the other side of it you're actually willing to put in that extra effort of the bag skates and all that because you actually appreciate your coach for communicating exactly. so yeah uh, it was nice to connect with him you know some good insights um, from you know, from his early days in Toronto and then to the media now and, and TSN. So, yeah, it, awesome it's dude. funny. I love how he kind of brought up being 19 years old and you get drafted in your hometown of oh, Toronto. Right. I can't, like talking about being an instant star. Yeah. I guess before you even have to do anything, yeah, really. Yeah, right, yeah. Like he probably couldn't go in a grocery store. You know, his face was plastered everywhere, like sure. you said. So. But I, I loved how he kind of said the, the pressure that goes along with that. I oh, couldn't I even imagine, imagine at 19 imagine. years old. I thought it was pressure be playing you know soccer in college oh. like i thought that was pressure you can't even imagine being 19 years old in your hometown of toronto exactly. in canada which is like you know like Crazy. playing for the yankees and you <laughs> yeah. know, being a new york guy so um yeah it was it was awesome to connect with him and uh and uh share some stories and yeah Great that's time. a wrap for episode 60 60 make sure we're tuning in next week episode 61 yes, sir till then Stay safe, knuckleheads. See you, knuckleheads.